Is that right? He's not? Okay. Tim served in the U.S. Air Force uh, four years. He began preaching part-time in 2000. This 2000 graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. He worked with the High Plains Church of Christ in Wyoming, Cheyenne, Wyoming for four years and is currently the preacher of Eastgate Church of Christ in Pensacola, Florida. There are certain uh, doctrinal concepts that are uh, set forth in the Bible that have been uh, grossly misconstrued, misapplied, and certainly the, uh, the uh, miracles are one of them. Not only uh, the purpose of miracles uh, when they were performed, but the uh, the uh, uh, supposition that miracles continue to exist today. So uh, Tim's going to talk to us about that, and if you please give your kind attention to him. I am uh, very excited to uh, be here. It has been wonderful to be uh, invited to uh, speak at this lectureship. I would have thought it a privilege just to be here even if I wasn't asked to uh, speak on it. Uh, the fellowship has just been absolutely wonderful. I think all of us, and not just preachers and elders, but all of us as brethren need a time where we can gather together and to hear God's word so ably uh, proclaimed, but to also enjoy the fellowship that Christians uh, well, one of the wonderful blessings of being a Christian is this kind of fellowship. We should be thankful for God who made that possible. When I was at the Memphis School of Preaching, before they went haywire, uh, they used to tell us that before you stand up before a, a congregation and preach God's Word, Lee knows this, and that you should at least button your coat. I would if I could. <laughs> I'll just uh, kind of leave it at that. I'd like to thank Brother Brown for the invitation, of course. It is uh, a privilege again to be here. It's also humbling to be with so many sound gospel preachers over the years who have stood for the faith for so many years, for so long, have not given in. I'm thankful for the eldership here. It reminds me of the eldership at Belfast. Uh, they haven't given an inch uh, in all these years as well. And folks, that's rare indeed. I'm thankful for this congregation who has decided to continue to walk in the old paths. So I'm uh, especially mindful of those who uh, do a lot of work behind the scenes. Uh, sometimes don't always get the credit. And especially those uh, women who prepared these wonderful meals and these lunches for us and you know, that's a lot of work. My mother used to say she would rather uh, feed a starving preacher than a preacher who really wasn't that hungry. <laughs> There's a lot of preachers around here who really aren't that hungry, but they act like it. <laughs> so I'm thankful for you, too. It's been wonderful to see these young people down here on the front row. Uh, that's, uh, that's church, folks. That's not just the future of the church. That's the church. My topic, of course, deals with miracles of Christ. This is something that those of us who have been Christian for a number of years, we understand what this is about, or at least we should. But there's a lot of people in the world today who really don't have a clue what a, a true biblical miracle really is. And so hopefully we'll be able to answer this. My time uh, allotted me. And we're going to look at uh, did Jesus actually work miracles, and if he did, uh, why did he? But think about that word miracle. There's a, Once again, there's a lot of people who in our day and time continue to believe that these miracles that we read about in the Bible are continuing to be, to be worked or to be performed, even though they don't have a shred of evidence to back it up. You get on the Internet, you type up the word miracle or miracles, you press search, and it will take you to all different kinds of websites of all different kinds of miracles that are be, being performed right now. I read of one recently of a, uh, a woman in Africa who was raised from the dead. No proof. 
And why is it when something like this happens, it is like on the other side of the globe? It's never in our backyard. Some places you never heard of. And it can't be proven. But so many people still continue to believe in miracles. And not just those in the denominational world, but I'm afraid some of our own brethren do. Even the, the worldly individual. Jason Camp, uh, Lester's son, told me the other day, he worked with an individual who believed in miracles, but she didn't, well, she wasn't sure if God existed or not. That was a new one on me. You're going to believe in miracles, don't you have to believe in God? And of course, we as Christians believe in miracles, but we just don't believe that they are continuing on, that they cease, that they serve their purpose. And you think about that word miracle itself. You know you hear the word miracle all the time? People you're talking with, you listen to the radio, you listen to the television, uh, and that wor word miracle is bandied about today, and, and we all know this, to such a degree that it's lost its meaning. People have no concept of what the biblical definition of a, a miracle is. Uh, a woman bringing a child into the life, this life, well, that's a miracle. Someone surviving a, a terrible accident, they will classify that as well as, as a miracle. We all watched on the news when that plane went down into the Hudson River. Uh, and there was a reporter I listened to stated, you know, if they make this into a movie, they will call it Miracle on the Hudson. And I thought, well, yeah, that's right, if they do. And they have referred to it since then, some reporters, as just that. But it wasn't a miracle. People were referred to the next... Uh, the pharmaceutical drug that comes out on the market will be the next miracle drug. Things that are just unexplainable are defined as a miracle. I was talking to a, a woman uh, just a couple of months ago who believed in miracles, and she gave me evidence of a miracle that was worked in her own life. She was uh, rather sickly at one period of time, and all of a sudden, she got better in a short period of time. She went to her doctor and he couldn't explain it. She couldn't explain it, even though she was seeing a doctor and even though she was taking medication. Because it was unexplainable, it had to have been a miracle. You see it in sports. You remember back in 1980, the Winter Olympics, when the Americans were just about to beat the Russians, the Soviets, and hockey, Al Michael. Do you believe in miracles? And how that has stuck with people over the years. You even see it in football games, where one football player at the end of the game will say it was a miracle that we were able to, to beat that other team. Come from behind the last few seconds. None of those were miracles. Vine's Bible Dictionary defines the word miracle coming from the, uh, the Greek word dunamis, as meaning power, inherent ability, is used of works of a supernatural origin and character, such as could not be produced by natural agents and means. I always like Brother Guy N. Wood's definition of the, the word miracle. He defined it as an event which the force of nature, including man's own natural powers, cannot produce, and which must therefore be attributed to supernatural sources. In other words, the event that the individuals witnessed with their own eyes, they could not describe it in any other way, but it had to be from God. It had to be a miracle. Now, a, a woman bringing a child into this life, into this world, that's a wonderful event, but it's according to natural law. Someone who has survived a, a terrible accident is, is truly fortunate indeed, but it's not a miracle. The things that are unexplainable, where did we ever get the idea that that was a miracle? There's a whole lot of things you can just ask my dad. There's a lot of things that I can't explain. It doesn't mean it's a miracle. We've all heard that, uh, that expression or that saying, how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow cheese? I don't know. Somebody knows, but I don't. And just because I don't know how it is done doesn't mean it's a miracle. 
And when you think about it, one football team being able to beat another, that's not a miracle. There was a reason for it, behind all of that. Uh, the Florida Gators were just better than the Oklahoma Sooners. That's why. Sorry, Jesse. But uh, I hope I won't become your enemy because I tell you the truth. <laughs> you can talk to me later. Now the heavens and the earth being created, including us, man. That was a miracle. The parting of the Red Sea was a miracle. The plagues that God brought upon Egypt, those were miracles, folks. The sun standing still. Jesus being able to heal someone of a disease, of leprosy. Raising the dead. Casting out demons. Those who couldn't see, immediately they could see. Those who had palsy were able to walk. All of these were biblical miracles, folks, that no one today, no matter what the charlatans of our time say, no one today can do. No one can produce. Now that brings us to our first question. Did Jesus work miracles? Yes. I guess we can go on to that next question. But no. As Peter said, we ought to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15. And we need to know these things. We need to be able to believe in these things. We need to be able to show other people why and what a miracle actually is. So is there evidence that Jesus performed miracles? We've noticed a lot of evidence given this past week about the Bible. Or the Paul Baum sermon, his lecture, showing us, proving us that the Bible is the Word of God. We've noticed in these lectureships that there is proof, that there is evidence, if you will, that there is a God. Once again, his Word is inspired, which means every word and every verse and, and every chapter and every book is the Word of God. God breathed these words to man. They wrote them down. They caught them. And if you think about that, you can prove that there is a God, therefore you can prove that his, the Bible is the Word of God, then you know that the, the truth that are in it are, is just exactly that, the truth. Therefore, the miracles that are found in the Scriptures are true. They happen just as they were written down. Now, just because there is evidence, does that mean people are simply going to accept that evidence? Of course not. We all know of a number of individuals, and they've been stated in this lectureship, of those who will continue to refuse to believe the evidence. If you've ever taught someone the truth, and they didn't obey, it wasn't because you didn't teach them the truth. It's that they refused to accept it. So you have the atheists who don't believe in God to begin with. They're, they're not going to accept the miracles in the Scriptures. Then you've got the agnostics who simply state, well, there's just not enough evidence. There's not enough proof for me to really make a decision whether there is a God or there's not a God. <clears throat> Do you ever wonder if agnostics go through life that way? I don't know if there's really enough evidence for me to even get out of bed this morning. What should I buy at the grocery store? What kind of work I should be involved in? Just not enough evidence. So I'm not going to do anything. Well, I doubt it. Probably just when it comes to religion. There are, of course, the religious critics, the biblical critics who state that, uh, well, they, they say anyway that they believe in parts of the Bible as the Word of God, but when it comes to the supernatural, when it comes to the miracles recorded in them, well, that's not the Word of God. That's not inspired. That's not rational. That's not logical. Actually, the evidence proves that it is logical. It is rational. Of course, if you remove the miracles from the Bible, and this is their point, well, what do we have left? They're trying to undermine people's faith. Where would we be as Christians if we had no miracles to believe in? Jesus being born. That's removed. 
And of course, that's their whole point. And the list is long of those down through the centuries, as has been mentioned in these lectureships, of those who refuse to believe in the evidence, in the proof that God provided for man to believe that Jesus worked miracles. And in putting this paper together, I noticed a, a number of names that uh, kept cropping up. Uh, one in particular, as, as we all know, is David Hume. This uh, Scottish philosopher who lived back in the 1700s, and uh, he was Scottish, not British, a philosopher, which is good. But when you think about David Hume, it's important to know his background. It's important to know that Hume was an agnostic, which tells us where he's going to be coming from. And when you read about the writings of David Hume, or, or the writings of what other people have written about him, you realize that when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to God's holy word, when it comes to the miracles recorded in them, he had an axe to grind. He didn't like it. So he tried to refute them. And basically he stated that miracles were a violation of natural law, and therefore he could not accept it. But who is the one who created that law? He also believed that... Uh, Miracles could not have been uh, performed because it went against human experience, evidently his human experience. Evidently because he wasn't there, that he didn't see them with his own eyes, that he couldn't lay his hands on them, that they could not have happened. You know that is really the height of arrogance. And there are cities on this planet that I've never been to. I've never walked their streets, I've never met the individuals who lived in those places, but just because I have not personally been there doesn't mean that they don't exist. And my grandfather was born around 1898. Now he lived long enough to see a man walking on the moon, but his father's generation, his grandfather's generation, they never witnessed something like that. It was foreign, it was alien for them, for someone to be able to do something like that. Does it mean that just one generation, just because it did not experience something that another generation did, that it couldn't happen? Absolutely not. I do believe that if you would take a David Hume or some other agnostic or an atheist and somehow was able to transport them back into time and they could actually witness Jesus performed a miracle, they, they would still refuse to believe. Of course, there were people in Jesus' own day. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees easily come to our minds. Of those who, although they witnessed his miracles with their own eyes, refused to believe that he was the Son of God. You know, you want to talk about being hard-hearted. They were hard-hearted. And this is, the, this is the elite of Israel. There was the time, Matthew chapter 12, where he cast the devil out of that individual. Now the common people, it tells us in verse 23, they believed that he was the son of David. In other words, that they believed that he was the son of God, the Messiah that they had been waiting for. However, the reaction of the Pharisees, if you remember, was completely different. This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, verse 24. And of course, he quickly uh, refuted their premise. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, some believed, but others ran and told the Sanhedrin. Now, what was their response? What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. John 11:47. they could not deny the miracles that he was performing, you think if they could, they would have? You know it. But they couldn't, so they just planned to kill him. But the evidence of Jesus working miracles, performing them is abundant, as John tells us, John 20, verse 30 and 31. A host of other verses that point this out. In the book, I mentioned, in the chapter, I mentioned a number of characteristics that we have of uh, miracles that would set them uh, apart from natural occurrences. One of the characteristics of a miracle is that they were performed before credible witnesses. And I think the key word there is credible. Because you have some people today who say that miracles are being performed but not before credible witnesses. 
Jesus would go out into a crowd of those who might believe in him, but most didn't as a son of God, and he was still able to perform miracles. There was a host of people who saw him before the, perform those miracles. Even his enemies, who would have loved to refute them, saw him work those miracles. But an eyewitness, you think of how important an eyewitness is today in our court systems. The crime is committed, and you've got two or three eyewitnesses to that crime. Well, that's pretty much a, a slam dunk case. And under the law of Moses, you remember before two or three witnesses, someone could be accused of adultery. They would be taken out of the city and stoned to death. So a number of individuals of that day, including his own disciples, watched him change that water into the wine, John 2, verse 11. There were the men of Gennesaret who were bringing the sick and the disease from all around that area to Jesus so they could be healed, so they could be cured. And even those who just touched the hem of his garment were made perfectly whole, it tells us. One individual said that they had hospitals at that period of time, he would have cleaned them out. And of course, there's, there's Paul's words recorded for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'd like to turn to that. His statement that he makes, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 4, speaking about Jesus, his resurrection, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren. Do we get that? 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. There were over 500 people at one time witnessed after his resurrection. What would, what would make a man like a Saul of Tarsus change to become the Apostle Paul? He saw it. He witnessed him with his own eyes on that road to Damascus. That's what it took. Hard to dispute, folks, I believe anyway. Of course, you do have to have a good and honest heart. But hard to dispute so many credible eyewitnesses. His disciples did not die for a lie. You think of the apostles, that inner circle. John is the only one we believe may not have uh, died a martyr's death, but the others we, we learn and did. We believe they did. Now think of that. Are you going to die for a lie? Now before you answer that, be careful, because there's a lot of people over the centuries, especially when it comes to religion, who have died for a lie. The Islam extremists, for example, right now are dying for a lie. But they never lived in the time of Muhammad. They never saw him. They never witnessed him with his own eyes. And by the way, Muhammad is still in the grave. Jesus rose out of that tomb. And his apostles saw him. Brother Stolting so ably proclaimed, Thomas touched him. They talked with him. They ate with him. They knew he was resurrected. Peter gave up fishing to be an apostle because he witnessed Jesus with his own eyes. So I, I cannot dispute all of those claims. Now there is evidence, of course, that Jesus performed miracles. Does that mean everybody's going to believe in it? Of course not. But we better. If we want to go to heaven. Why did Jesus work miracles? Our second question. That's a good question. We need to always realize that God has always had a reason or a purpose for doing anything and everything. Nothing was ever left to happen chance. There's always a purpose behind it. And when you look at some of the uh, examples in the Old Testament of the miracles that were performed, I do believe it shed some light upon the miracles in the New Testament. They were performed for a purpose as well. 
You remember when God came to Moses, a chosen Moses to go into Egypt and bring the children out of bondage, the Hebrew children out of bondage. He made a number of excuses. Well, he wasn't the one. We probably would have too if we'd been there. There was a question that uh, Moses asked, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Exodus 4. 1. God was able to do something, to remove that doubt. He was to cast that rod onto the ground, and when it turned into a serpent, he was to do what? Pick it up by the tail? Which shows a lot of faith on his part picked it up by the tail, and it turned back into that rock. But there was a purpose for that miracle. And that was to show the children of Israel that God did appear to them, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee, Exodus 4, 5. What was the purpose behind those uh, plagues that God brought upon Egypt? Was it simply to bring the children of Israel out of bondage? Was that just the only reason? Remember, every one of those plagues attacked their false gods, Egypt. That was to show them, to show Pharaoh, that there was only one God. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring the children of Israel out from among them. Exodus 7, 5. And even the people, the nations around them, Exodus 9, 16, would know that as well. At least there'd be the evidence of it. Elijah was able to, through God's power, raise up that widow's son who died. But there was a reason behind it. And we, we know of that reason or that purpose from her own words that are recorded for us to this day. She stated, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God. That the words of the Lord in his mouth, that they were truth, 1 Kings 17, 24 tells us. So noticing some of these miracles in the past that would provide proof, evidence, that Israel's God was the one true God. That God's prophets spoke his words and not their own definitely shed some light on why Jesus performed miracles in his day and time. And has been mentioned already, one of those reasons, of course, was to prove his deity, to confirm him as the Son of God. Now, God understood, our Father in heaven understood that man would need some proof, that man would need some, some evidence. Remember that faith is a substance or the assurance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, another word for, for evidence in there is conviction, as the ASV states it. But also, proof. Christ would give them proof over and over again to the miracles that he was able to perform that proved that he was deity. 100% man, 100% God, same time. He was the son of God. Brother Bruce mentioned uh, the incident where they lowered the, the man who was sick of the palsy down from that roof because it was so crowded, Mark chapter 2. Not only would Jesus heal that man of the palsy so he would be able to walk again, but before that, what did he state? He was going to forgive him of his sins. Now here you had also the scribes. who reasoned in their hearts that he blasphemed. Because only God can do that. Only God can forgive sins. Well, he was. And they just would not accept it. But he had an answer for that. The individual, Jesus himself, who had the power to, to heal a man who was lame, would also have the power from the same God to forgive sins. Understanding their hearts, he stated, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. 
And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Mark 2, verse 10 through 12. Never seen anything like that before. Showing his proof. Brother David Lipscomb, commenting on these verses, wrote, He proposed by working a miracle they could all see, and about which there could be no doubt, to show that he possessed divine power. God was with him, and hence he had power to forgive sins. Amen. That's exactly correct. Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, but who had a good and honest heart, understood this. As he told Jesus, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. John 3, verse 2. When John the Immerser sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus had a response for them, if you remember. Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. Go and show John again those things which he do hear and see, he stated. What were they watching? What would people be able to say? That the blind received their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are, are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel Preach to them, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Matthew 11, 4 through 6. Isaiah of old wrote many years ago of the miracles that the Messiah would be able to work, be able to perform. So they had this proof of this. They had writings of the Old Testament prophets that spoke of this. And yet, most of them still refused to believe. As most still refuse to believe today. Some things just don't change. Most people will not accept Jesus as the Son of God, even though there's evidence. And we are going to be, John 12, 48, judged by his words. Better know them. John wrote, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name, John 20, 30, and 31. What was written? Those miracles recorded in this book. Why? That the world would believe that he was and is the Son of God. And the importance of that, of course, is salvation is only found through his name. Not Mohammed. Not Joseph Smith. Not the Pope of Rome. No one. But Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. On the day of Pentecost, the city of Jerusalem, Peter preached that marvelous sermon that spoke of the importance of Jesus as the Son of God. Salvation was only through him. He meant of Israel. Hear these words, he said. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved among you by God. What did he do? Work those miracles, wonders, signs which God did by him in the midst of you as much as ye yourselves also know. Acts 2, verse 22. As ye yourselves also know, those men had witnessed the miracles that Jesus performed. They knew it was true. There was no denying it. It's very clear that at least one purpose of Jesus performing miracle was to prove to the world, to us today, that he's the Son of God. Now, very closely associated with that, of course, is the miracles that he performed, manifested forth his glory, proving that the words that he spoke were also from God, from heaven. Confirmed his word. And how important is that? When uh, the Great uh, Commission started, when Jesus sent the apostles out to evangelize the world, Mark writes, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, with them, and confirming the word with signs following, Mark 16, 20. Now think about that. As the miracles that the apostles performed proved that the words that they spoke were not their own, 
from God. Jesus performing the miracles that he did would do the same thing. Would prove to the world that God sent him. That his words were true. These were words that they needed to heed. That he was the son of God. Henry Thayer defined the word confirm as to make firm, to establish, to make sure. And that's what his words did. That's what the miracles that he performed did. They made sure, they made firm that his words were from God. He wasn't a false Messiah. He was the Son of God. The Hebrew writer left no question about that when he wrote, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. So there's proof, as we all know. The miracles Jesus performed and the words that he taught, of course, went hand in hand, folks, hand in hand. Remember again his words to John's disciples, go and show John again those things which he do here, and see, Matthew 11, 3. Jesus had a discussion with his disciples, stated, Believest thou not that I am the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake, John 14, 10 through 11. Jesus gave proof from his testimony and from the works. If you're not going to believe what I say through my words, then at least believe me for the very works' sake. You've got eyes. You've got a heart. You can understand these things. Think about all the different miracles that Jesus was able to perform during his earthly ministry. He went about doing good, Acts 10, 38 healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Why? God was with him. But all the miracles that he was able to perform, none of these so-called miracle workers can produce today. And they won't even try some of the miracles that he did, changing the water into wine, feeding the, the multitudes with a few loaves and fishes. And all of these would show his power over all of these different things. But when have you tried to see uh, one of these charlatans do something like that? Calming the tempest at the sea, showing his power over nature. He arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm over a number of hours. You all asleep? It doesn't say there was great calm over a number of hours, Matthew 8, 26. It was that quick. It was immediate. His disciples saw it. They were amazed. What kind of man is this? That even the winds and the seas obey him. Another example or a characteristic of a miracle, folks, is that they were immediately performed. They were done. He never told anyone, go home in six months. You'll be able to walk. They were done right then, proving that he was the Son of God. There are always will be people amongst us who will refuse to believe in the biblical miracles that Jesus performed. We can teach them the truth, but if they don't accept it, that's going to be their fault. But they should not be allowed to meet the Lord on the day of judgment, being able to say, no one told me. So that's our duty. But the evidence is there, folks. But the reason he was able to perform these miracles, to confirm him as the Son of God, to confirm his word as coming from God, also tells us, if you think about it, why miracles are not being performed today. Words confirmed. And unless we're going to have some kind of new revelation, which we know that's not going to happen, Jude 3, then there's no longer a reason for biblical miracles to be produced, to be performed. 
Now, I understand that this lesson this morning was very basic for all of us. We've heard it a number of years uh, over the time that we've been Christians, but there may be someone who doesn't understand this. Maybe, hopefully, someone on the Internet who will listen to these messages and have a clear understanding of what the Bible teaches. And, of course, as we all know, the Holy Spirit believed in repetition. And I thank you so very much for your kind attention. I seem to recall uh, some years ago that uh, a fellow named John O'Dowd, whom some of you know, that there was a healing service uh, being conducted over in East Texas somewhere where they were going to also raise somebody from the dead. And they actually had somebody on the stage, and they had a casket, somebody on the stage that was laid out in all their finery. And of course, if you know John O'Dowd, uh, he would do some unusual things. But he, uh, before the service started, he kind of snuck up on the stage and he had a hat pin and looking both ways. And he, stuck that hat pin in a corpse and the corpse came alive. <laughs> well, who was conducting the service so mad they had him arrested. And I think the uh, police chief or sheriff whoever was arresting just was laughing. <laughs> you know, how, how can you actually uh, uh, cost or uh, injure someone that's already dead? So that, that was dismissed. So if people are going to maintain that there are miracles today, they have to be able to do miracles such as were done by the apostles in New Testament times and certainly can't be done. Most people don't understand what miracles are, are for, uh, what the design and purpose of miracles, and the fact that the uh, uh, their utility has passed. They've done what they were supposed to do. So I appreciate that, Tim. It's a very good word, something that we all need to keep in mind. Uh, shall we now be dismissed?